Greetings, travelers. It is I, Vincent Price's ghost, here to guide you through a world of spooks and horrors, the likes of which you... Ah, oh, forget it. Halloween's coming. Here are some horror games. Evil Tonight is a miniature Resident Evil built in a top-down RPG style, though it's not an actual RPG. You aim and fire in real time, using a similar scheme to classic Resident Evil, and depend on a tight supply of health and, to a lesser extent, ammo to survive. There's no XP, though there is a stamina bar that limits stabbing and dodging. Overusing either action leaves you dazed in place temporarily. Knife attacks are always available while using a gun, and the game encourages mixing both to conserve ammo and avoid stamina drain. The rhythm of shooting, dodging, and slashing is satisfying once you get used to it, and the top-down fighting is actually less clunky than the fixed camera games that inspired it. The game has that modern RPG engine look, where the vignettes and smoothness somehow make it look slightly cheap, but the sprite work and animation are very appealing overall. The storm effect on the billowing plants and trees in outdoor areas is especially neat. There's an 80s anime style to the character portraits that suits the in-game pixel look and the light tone of the dialogue well, though that light tone is a little awkward in a horror game. The story is pretty boring in my opinion, delivered mostly through repetitive diary entries that drone on about a school drama. For a game that's only three hours long, it's not in a hurry to cover much ground. The tone set by the art and dialogue is too cute for the game to ever really be scary, but the school setting still delivers plenty of spooky. A good soundtrack does half the lifting to set that mood, with some of it channeling the vibe of John Carpenter's The Thing. I'd play a three second clip for comparison, but then Universal would seize control of the video and fill it with body spray ads, which is truly terrifying. Searching the campus will turn up keys to new wings of the various buildings, leading to a healthy amount of backtracking and puzzle solving despite the short length. The puzzles seem a little divisive and have drawn complaints on the Steam community, but I mostly found them okay. They tend to be tests of perception rather than problem solving, with the solution usually hidden as a visual cue somewhere in the room. What dragged them down was mostly the complete lack of a map. You play by memory for the whole game. It may be a small-ish world, but unless you have a photographic memory, it becomes too much to keep track of. It's not so bad until the second half, when the backtracking becomes far-flung between all parts of the campus. All of the gratification of finding a key item is drained by the subsequent confusion about where its matching obstacle had been and the random searching of rooms that follows. Getting a small key means that I now have to find that one locked drawer, and then I have to find that VCR, and then I have to find that locked box. The decision to forego a map was a substantial blow to the enjoyability of the game. The fun is also hampered by some control and balancing issues. I found auto-aim to perform badly when two or more enemies were on screen, so I turned it off early, but the knife still seemed to swing with a mind of its own. I'm not pressing up in this footage, and even if I had been, it should only slide your character upwards without turning that direction. Those off-course lunges cause enough problems that I have to assume the knife is bugged and that it's not intended behavior. There's definitely a bug with certain enemies failing to respond to stab attacks, which got me killed more than a few times. But more than the glitch, those deaths were caused by health pickups being given so strictly in the last half of the game. There was a half-hour stretch without a single one, with over a dozen ammo pickups in the same span of time. On a harder difficulty, this would be fine, but on the default balanced mode, it felt anything but balanced. I limped along on a single hit worth of health for the last quarter of the game, cheating through fights by swinging through barriers, and restarting long stretches so often that I made it a habit of backtracking to save after every few enemies. Steam showed a one and a half hour discrepancy from my save file, all of which was spent on these do-overs, which is pretty significant for a game this short. Replacing just one of those excessive ammo pickups with health would have made this fair. Ah, that's nice. Enemies also get ridiculously spongy in the second half, draining your dodging stamina even when guns are in the mix. The shotgun, the most powerful weapon, prevents dodging during its pump animation, so you'll get hit unless that shot is the coup de grace. It became hard to avoid damage in close quarters, so I just blasted through whenever I had the bullets for it. But as generous as the ammo is, you will run out when playing this way. The last leg of the game spawns these sponges everywhere. Between this and the lack of a map and control bugs, I was pretty relieved that the game ended as quickly as it did. It's a shame that something so fun in its first half unravels so much at the end, especially when small tweaks could fix all of it. I'd still recommend giving Evil Tonight a chance during a Steam sale, because it's such a unique and appealing game concept, and it mostly works. Just hoard some health for the end. Or play better. Either way. Song of Horror uses classic fixed-camera gameplay as a foundation while trying to push in its own direction. 
The style and mood are similar to Remake, but an idealized version, with real-time 4K instead of waxy upscales. And the visuals are technically and artistically impressive for a studio with four primary developers. The game is split into episodes taking place in different locations, and each is extremely detailed and brimming with atmosphere. The only visible tell that this was made by such a limited staff is that character animations can be weird, but it's easy to overlook. The camera system is fixed in the Silent Hill style, which means not fixed at all. It follows you around the rooms, making fewer hard cuts, and for the most part it behaves very well. There are none of Silent Hill's whiplash-inducing swings. Occasionally doors or items will be on a wall directly beneath the camera, which makes them easy to miss, but the problem is rare. Modern stick movement is forced with no option for tank controls. Some will prefer it that way, but it's not very consistent or reliable. Directional changes between cameras can be awkward, especially when using staircases, where characters often reverse direction or get stuck on corners. On the plus side, you can use the right stick to align your gaze with nearby items and prompts, which is actually helpful. The controls benefit from a complete lack of combat to stress them. The horror is fully supernatural and psychological, going even further in that direction than Silent Hill. Instead of shooting, you deal with threats by hiding and enduring QTE events. These are semi-random, triggering more often when you run instead of walk. It gives the game an unpredictable quality, at least for the first episode, where you're never sure what's going to happen or how you'll have to deal with it. Instead of the standard rationing of supplies and ammo, you survive by keeping track of hiding places and listening for ghosts at doors. It's much more about caution than action. The various characters have stats that make encounters more or less frequent, or easier or harder to clear, and any deaths are permanent. The developers intended for this to be part of the experience and made it nearly impossible to avoid. Wherever a character dies, the next can collect their belongings from that room and pick up where they left off. As long as you have players left, the episode continues. It is interesting to see the varying perspectives and dialogue that different characters bring to the same scenario, and your choice can dramatically change the context of the story. But the developers mostly blow the mechanic by handing out permadeaths like candy. You're much more likely to die from a simple text choice than a ghost attack, since the outcomes are so random. Reaching into a sink kills you in Episode 1. In Episode 3, the exact same thing is required to make progress. Sometimes picking something up kills you. Other times not picking it up kills you. You may as well flip a coin. Pulling a sheet off a mirror was my first cause of death. I suppose the broken mirrors all over the game are supposed to be a warning, but it doesn't really follow that just seeing one will be fatal, especially after seeing plenty that are not broken. I double-checked my files and had nothing foreshadowing it there either. If there is a clue about this, I found the mirror first. I ran into my ghost seconds after restarting and saw a prompt to talk to it. This killed my second character immediately. It might seem like I walked into this one, but you're actually supposed to talk to them. It depends on the dialogue they're saying. It's easy to fall into traps like this because there are so many pointless rooms and excessive UI prompts to check that when you finally do see something interactive, you assume you're supposed to do it. This is one of those games that actually benefits from cheating and using a guide. At least to skim through and look up all of the cheap kills so that you don't have to agonize over whether every item pickup or a jar door will end your life. My third death quickly followed the others because listening at a door didn't reveal the threat until after I had pressed open. Sometimes the tentacle sound that tips you off to ghouls is delayed, and it's low enough that any ambient noise will cover it up. In my case, playing with an air conditioner made it inaudible even with headphones. My fourth and final death came from a heartbeat minigame. These QTE events pop up frequently as the game goes on, and, after the initial novelty wears off, feel like they stretch on for absurdly long lengths of time. The heart flashes, beats, and rumbles the controller one instant, but you're supposed to push the buttons in the moment after that. When the event didn't seem to be ending, I varied the timing to see what happened. The feedback is confusing, with the heart pumping when the QTE is successful but vibrating otherwise, animations which are very hard to tell apart in the moment. The devs already addressed the clarity of this once, but in a minimal way that barely moved the needle. Just a standard red flash when it's wrong, anything really would work. And so, the last player fucked, the episode restarted from the beginning. You can lose up to four or five hours of progress when this happens. The community for the game is flooded with a disproportionate number of complaints about this and the other QTEs, but they're far from the only sources of cheap deaths. Six very similar corridors have to be memorized to navigate a library, and if you take a few wrong turns, you're toast. A later puzzle presents a room full of interactable objects that are tempting to investigate, but pulling them results in death. 
You're given absurdly short camera flashes indicating the correct ones, then challenged to figure out where those were from a completely different fixed camera angle. Opening any door in an asylum is an insta-kill, which I was ready for because I read ahead, like a coward. However, the stethoscope that's supposed to finally allow you to check which rooms are safe was bugged and didn't work. This was a known issue on the community page, marked as fixed, and some players had resorted to wasting their characters to test the six doors one by one. This is at the very end of an episode that only gives you two lives, and you can imagine the frustration of losing hours of progress by blowing them both here. Luckily in my case, restarting the game fixed the bug. There was a less lucky glitch when using the peephole in an apartment door. If you interact with this prompt, you're doomed. All buttons stop responding and you have to force close through Steam. The developers pledged to fix the bug in 2021. I know it's a small team and all, but it shouldn't take years to remove a defective, game-ending prompt. After a few episodes of this, I resorted to baby mode. The lowest difficulty removes permadeath and allows restarting from checkpoints. I also enabled a visual assist for listening at doors, which is, kind of amusingly, your character doing a little frowny face when hearing a ghost. The developers warned that this isn't the intended experience, but it fixed most of the problems I had in one fell swoop. The QTE interruptions were less frequent and seemed up to 20 seconds shorter. A cheap character death could be brushed off with a restart. Lesson learned, don't touch the thing. Or do touch it. Whichever. Everything felt more appropriately balanced and smooth, and if anything it was scarier since I could get immersed in the atmosphere without the cheap clutter turning the fear into frustration. So after pulling on a bib and switching to pampers mode for tiny little babies, the puzzles were the only remaining drag on the gameplay. Most of them are fine. You study documents for clues about a password or assemble a tool out of found parts. But occasionally they stretch into insanely convoluted processes that are hard to follow. Think of the V-Jolt mixing from Resident Evil, but made five times longer and with double the ingredients, and you'll have a sense of it. One sequence requires identifying the owner of a hat by looking at photos, then comparing test schedules to determine the subject they taught, looking that subject up in a card catalog, using one professor's name to identify the specific shelf, and then using the other professor's hat size to go six shelves to the right of that spot. That item chain later leads to the filing location of a microfilm. An exact date has to be looked up, so I randomly entered timestamps from the notes I had found. It didn't really make sense that the date a modern note was written would be the date needed for a 1913 archive, but it was my only guess. And it was correct. But nothing happens unless you notice a scroll wheel to the right and use it to navigate to a specific page. Which still does nothing until you notice the partially cut off print button and hit it. A wall of keys has to be whittled down to a select few using the process of elimination, with colored keys being one of the exempt categories. Only the solution includes a colored key. It's okay if only the top half is colored, I guess? Why muddy the solution by adding color to it at all? Another is based on assembling a torn photo, which is exactly as finicky and strict about placement as you fear it will be. You then have to count features like mustaches and glasses to get a passcode, but the icons that suggest this were cropped out of view when at the terminal. I had to back out and open the file in the inventory, where it's very hard to see the features even when they're not obscured by tears. This didn't happen on the Steam Deck, so maybe the game has display issues at different resolutions. I could not get my tally to match up to the answer I found online, which was a common outcome. The riddles didn't make sense even after cheating. These excessively long code entries based on illegible clues and big leaps of logic are exactly what cheat walkthroughs are made for. Confusion is also caused by poltergeist events, which aren't very scary and mostly just stop the game to shake things for 30 seconds. Oh, good thing. It's over now. One of these events flooded a hallway and blocked off the one door I needed in order to advance. In other cases, doors would randomly become possessed by ghosts. When progress is blocked like this, the logical reaction is to maybe recheck old rooms for an alternate way forward. That doesn't exist. There's no signal when these obstructions clear up, so unless you know to keep rechecking the possessed doors over and over, it's easy to get stumped and waste time. I wish this one had more polish because the general exploration and storytelling is done so well. It's a mostly good game, blighted by a few poor decisions. I assume the problem is a lack of playtesting. A smaller team like this is mostly going to get feedback from the actual players after launch, at which point it's too late to make fundamental changes. I'd be really interested in a sequel that works out all of the obtuse and cheap bullshit plaguing this release, but the devs at least give you the options to fix some of it. I recommend Song of Horror as long as you stick to the easy mode and keep a guide at the ready for the most inscrutable puzzles. The care the team put into their settings and atmosphere is worth powering through the rest. Alyssa? 
the next stop is yours. Elisa is a faithful homage to classic Resident Evil, specifically channeling the waxy early CG look of the first game. The developer really nailed the corny but eerie vibe those sparse backgrounds had, and the attention to detail even extends to plasticky full motion video sequences. It feels as authentic as loading a PS1 rip in an emulator, apart from a few modern intrusions. The game borrows the currency system and merchant mechanic from Resident Evil 4, and limits you to a dual weapon loadout modeled after Call of Duty. Tank controls can also be swapped for modern turning, for those who prefer movement to be oriented around stick direction. But whether you choose the modern option or not, it's going to feel like ancient jank. While the game ostensibly has controller support, nothing works until making a keyboard config or loading one from the Steam community, and the default bindings open the Steam overlay if you try to change weapons while running. The run button sometimes stops responding when changing rooms. It has to be released and pressed again before the input is recognized. Later in the game, all movement seem to briefly fail after screen transitions. That delay is actually enough to put you in the hands of a randomly spawning enemy, who's often sprung on you the instant a room loads. Pushing objects didn't work when using tank controls, only with modern. I found this out after becoming desperate enough to screw with the options in the hopes of a solution. The 180 quick turn is also unreliable, sometimes not working or taking so long to respawn that I had already pressed the buttons again, doing a 360 to where I started. Likewise, the auto-aim is extremely inconsistent, sometimes missing enemies directly in front of you. Sometimes it turns your character to face the targets behind you, like in Resident Evil. Sometimes not. The results are wildly different depending on distance and enemy type, and even when you do snap to a target, the vertical aim has to be slowly adjusted by degrees. Resident Evil designed its enemies around full up or full down aiming. Get close, point downward, done. Elisa has enemies that use bayonets if you get close, but crouch just under your default line of fire from a distance, so you have to go through this stiff adjustment act every time. The UI does provide an orange crosshair to indicate when shots will connect, which is helpful, but by the time you fire, you're often pointing at air. There are a lot of low-to-the-ground enemies that move much faster than you can rotate, which is pretty much the worst-case scenario for tank-style aiming. Instead of playing like an homage to old fixed-camera games, it feels like a spiteful parody of them. A monument to everything that was ever clumsy and frustrating about that style. The enemies also seem to react to you even if you're on a different floor, which leads to them piling up to ambush you at the bottom of the main hub staircase with hilarious regularity. There are sections where the only way to avoid getting boxed in by spawning enemies is to run forward at full speed as soon as the room loads, which you can't possibly know the first time around. And even when you do, a train of assholes long enough to block out the camera can form behind you. And when a stalker character randomly blocks off the only escape route, it becomes a proper clusterfuck. It doesn't feel like there's much rhyme or reason to the enemy placements. A mob of things is tossed in and you either evade it or die. I've noticed that if I criticize anything relating to fixed cameras, at least one comment will lord it as proof that they're always bad, and that I only like them in Resident Evil because of nostalgia. But no, it is possible for games to do fixed cameras better or worse than one another, like anything else. I replayed the original Resident Evil to warm up for this video. I've barely touched this version since the remake came out in 2002, so I had mostly forgotten how it handled. And yeah, it can be clunky at times, especially when the hunters enter the mix, but for the most part it controls well for what it is. Enemies are slow and few and far between, and the auto-aim is reliable, so a single enemy can be dispatched with ease. Even when Resident Evil 2 exploded the enemy count, there was an order to it. Plenty of gaps to run through, and enemies didn't move off their marks until you got close enough to them. It was never sheer chaos. The cameras also tended to keep your character near the center of the screen so that you could quickly orient yourself after each cut. And whenever an extreme angle was chosen, the developers usually had a specific purpose for it. To highlight an object, or to set up a scare. Elisa uses extreme angles all the time, for no particular reason. Your character flips all over the screen as they change, sometimes not appearing at all. There are dead zones where you cannot see what's going on, and some important doors and objects aren't visible until you move to some far corner of the area. Instead of pulling in when approaching a point of interest, the camera often gets farther away, which makes simple item pickups disorienting. During a stealth section, the camera switches to a reverse shot that obscures the player and makes it impossible to tell if she's hidden or not, although the bad guy machine gunning her to death gives a clue. On the second try, I got a different angle that was much more natural. On the third, it was back to the awkward reverse shot. You have to move past the altar to see behind it. It's like the shots are out of order. I don't want to sound too harsh on the developer because fixed cameras are a tough art form to master. Capcom, once again, had the benefit of playtesters and a team of devs to work out problems, whereas Casper Crows mostly did everything by himself. 
the modeling, the renders, all of it. It's an impressive amount of work, and I'm sure it's harder than it looks. But it's still hard to forgive stealth. In a pre-rendered game where you can't see the enemies, where they're looking, or whether they've spotted you, with any detection resulting in a surefire stunlock death. Except when this happens. I don't know what this is. Stunlocks are very common given the clunkiness of your character and her slow motion animations. Your only strong weapon for most of the game is a one-shot blunderbuss, which takes so long to reload you practically have to flee to a different screen before attempting it. Returning to Resident Evil feels like activating god mode after playing this. You picked the wrong day to be a pussy. Eat shit and die. Bitchin. Shut up. Infect this. Take it, baby. Take it, baby. My ass, your face. Take it, baby. By the time you finally unlock a shotgun as competent as what that old PlayStation title gave you, Elisa is nearly over and there are few enemies left to use it on. With both the controls and the weapons fighting against you, it would be best to run past enemies and avoid combat altogether, but the currency system makes that impossible. You depend on dropped tooth wheels for everything, from saving to healing to restocking ammo to attaining new guns, and avoiding combat means also avoiding all of those things. It's still pretty hard to afford what's needed even when grinding through every enemy, partly because it's necessary to spend so much on saving. There are so many abrupt game-ending scenarios that you have to grind through the game one five-minute stretch at a time, saving constantly to gain any purchase on your progress. A reference to Resident Evil's compactor room has an extremely obtuse puzzle tacked onto it, which I have to imagine the majority of players will die on their first time. Or second time. Or third time. Maybe fourth, with a fairly long return trip and unskippable cutscene every time. Without completely spoiling it, there's an attempt at a vehicle segment towards the end of the game that made me wish I was flying the jet from Resident Evil 6 instead. Bosses require huge bullet loads that I rarely had, prompting me to restart and scrape together whatever cash I could to buy more. One fight provides a few boxes beforehand but hides them in a bewildering maze where half the passages aren't visible, and you have to hope the ammo is for one of the two guns on your person at the time. Resident Evil allowed you to carry a handgun and shotgun for normal enemies, with space enough for a magnum in the event of a boss. With only two slots, I almost never had the magnum on me. There's a sword that nullifies the ammo issue, but it's so slow and weak that I also never carried it. So in half the boss fights, it was mandatory to quit and change equipment, repeating whatever lead-ups there had been along the way. The game pushes this kind of backtracking when it doesn't seem necessary. A pendulum gauntlet is the only connection to a major area of the game, and in that area, a trapdoor sends you back to the starting hall, just so you can traverse the pendulums yet again to get back to where you were. It's like this is scientifically engineered anti-fun. I really wish that I could recommend Elisa. Its heart is in the right place, and it's weird in all the right ways. Casper Crowe's poured his soul into this, even doing some of the voices himself along with his girlfriend, which is as handmade and indie as it gets. On paper, it's a charming time capsule to a bygone era, but in reality it's less of a throwback to the classic fixed camera games and more of a regression from them. The game has its fans, so maybe it's just me, but Steam's achievement rates imply that only 20% of players hang around after the first boss, which sounds about right. If you really like the look of Elise and have a lot of patience, you might be able to have a good time with it, but the game won't let it go without a fight. You picked the wrong day to be my ass. Singus is the coolest game I've ever played. It has one of the most striking visual styles I've seen from an indie game, perfectly straddling a line between pixel art and low-poly 3D. The developers apparently started with pixels but transitioned to 3D capped at 360p, and a camera mod reveals that the final game is almost all polygons. I easily could have been fooled into believing it was the other way around. The assets and careful framing really sell the 2D look, and as cool as it is that you can play over the shoulder with mods, a lot is clearly lost without the fixed compositions. That 3D foundation enables advanced shadows and lighting, some of which wouldn't look out of place in a high-res modern game. There are constantly other flourishes, like reflections and glass distortions, that add impressive flash without spoiling the low-res aesthetic. Everything fuses beautifully. It's like playing a work of art. The anime-style cutscenes are the only part I wasn't blown away by. Not that they're bad, but they stick out as generic next to the much more interesting in-engine visuals. The gameplay is about as inventive as the graphics. The perspective frequently changes from top-down to first-person for dream sequences or puzzle interactions. These sequences can be complicated, like in Song of Horror, 
only these have the benefit of actually making sense. As long as you pay attention to every document, there's a logical through-line connecting every step that keeps you interested and engaged. It's actually the exact kind of problem-solving I want out of these games. The answers aren't immediately obvious, and you have to think through and test out a solution, and there's always an exhilarating little feeling when it actually works. A radio mechanic leads to some of the most memorable ones. Data can be received on certain channels, and it's up to you to determine how and where to use it. Sometimes you have to set up a new transmission to broadcast codes into a different area, or even tune to certain frequencies to kill enemies in a feedback loop. It's just one example among many of the smart and creative game design Signalis offers. There are a couple of duds that do drop to Song of Horror levels of irritation, like one that depends on photography that ends up too pixelated and blurry to even read, and goes on at least one phase too long from there. But the batting average for puzzles is high. While the game does not try to emulate any series directly, a Silent Hill influence grows more apparent in each area, and Resident Evil DNA can be seen in the save rooms, item boxes, model examination, and even crimson heads that revive unless burned. That mechanic is kind of bungled by a severe lack of flares to work with. Burning is barely even a factor in the game. Given how rare the flares are, it's also disappointing that you can't double burn piled up bodies like in Remake, especially when the stun rod gets to double fuck shit up. The enemies revive very quickly and very often, so there's no element of surprise or tension when walking by them. You know they're going to rise. It mostly just feels like wasting bullets to fight the same enemies a second time, though in fairness the game gives you plenty of ammo to do this. Twin stick controls are used for the shooting and they feel great as long as the enemy is at a distance. The laser auto locks after connecting with an enemy and gradually focuses as you wait, rewarding you with more damage than quick shots. It's oddly gratifying to aim while moving, as if to say, look at me! I'm tactical! Up close, things get a lot clumsier. Your character will shove enemies instead of firing, which is much less desirable when trying to shotgun a close group, and the auto lock becomes too sticky to change targets. Downed enemies require a final tap to die, and the lock tended to favor them instead of the one still attacking. Stop forcing heavy auto locks in games, please. Any nearby obstruction will cause your aim to break and point upward. This makes sense in terms of preventing your gun from clipping through pillars and such, but it's a nasty surprise for your aim to fail in the heat of a fight. There's a stun rod item that nicely compensates for the awkwardness of guns at short range. In fact, it basically solves it completely, but it was hard to make use of due to the absurdly strict inventory. I had a whole section here about how six slots was unworkable and had an outsized impact on the pacing, causing ceaseless backtracking to item boxes. In some cases, you had to play completely unarmed to avoid leaving pickups behind, especially considering that some rooms seal off after being explored, claiming anything left in them. I was going to talk about how an eight-slot inventory would have transformed the game, and how secondary equipables like the flashlight should have had their own dedicated spot, like the lighter or lockpick in Resident Evil. Then out of nowhere, the devs just released a patch that did all of that. God damn it. I still thought highly of the game before, but now I want to give the developers a hug. This is a huge boost to an already good game, and I can strongly recommend it without any reservations now. It's an excellent and stylish take on survival horror, and the only game in this list that left me wanting to dive straight back in for a replay. Just be sure to use the extended inventory option, and don't look back. That does it for this batch. Four horror games and the scariest thing about them was their goddamn lack of polish. But I hope this helped you find something to play for Halloween. Who knows what terrors the next horror showcase will hold in store. Probably the games I'm showing right now, that would be my guess. BOO!